Welcome back. I would like to start today with a thought exercise. So let's pretend that you are trapped in the trunk of a car. Now, I'm not sure why you're in the trunk of a car. What are your life choices that you're in the trunk of a car? I don't know. But you're trapped, and uh, you don't know where you're going. You don't know where they're taking you, but you've tried to get out, and you can't. So you got nothing to do but just kind of lay there. And as you're laying there, you look over, and you see this note on the trunk of the the floor of the trunk and it's like looks like one of those middle school love notes folded a certain way you breach over and pull the note over and you open it and it says good news good old mother says if i if it doesn't rain i can do the thing and it's got like a heart and uh, a kissy face or something on it and that's it that's the whole note so you're like okay well note i guess but as you're laying there with all this time on your, your hands, you start to think of, it just suddenly pops in your head, like, I wonder why they put good old mother. Was that sarcasm? Was that like good old mother? Or do they mean it? Is it good old mother? And like a term of endearment, there comes good old mother. Or like, what is it? And also you notice that mother is capitalized and very formal for such a, like a middle school love note. You're like, why formal mother instead of mom? And why not just say mom says? Why good old mother? Get curious about that. I mean, there's no way to know, of course. You don't know what the thing is they're going to. You don't have any idea, but, uh, you know, it starts your brain turning, your brain uh, working about your mother. And uh, you've always called her mom, but lately things have been strained between you. And you wonder if maybe mother isn't a more appropriate term now that there's some distance or, you know, uh, maybe you need the distance there. It's a very complicated situation. And yeah, your mother is good, but, you know, things have been strained in your family, maybe with you and the siblings. You also wonder, like, hmm, I wonder why she wrote this, meaning the note writer. And then you sort of laugh at yourself and you go, I guess that's kind of sexist to assume it's a girl that wrote it. Why did you make that assumption? So all this stuff pops up in your head and all because you saw this note that had nothing to do with you written by someone that you'll likely never meet and yet still it brought up all these things in yourself about your values and assumptions and relationships that thought exercise illustrates something valuable i want to try to get across to you in this course but first i want to talk about the term intentional fallacy now the intentional fallacy well, a fallacy is a mistake, okay? So uh, anything that's a falsehood or a mistake is a fallacy. Uh, the intentional part of this, this term, intentional fallacy, is a particular kind of mistake that says the only correct way to interpret a work of art is to know what the artist intended by creating that art. So this way of art, uh, this way of analyzing art says, uh, like a class like this is designed to tell you the answer, to tell you what the author intended. You've got to put that on the test. You've got to know the correct interpretation. But it's a fallacy because it's not the only way to interpret a piece of art. Now, it is not that interpreting and analyzing a piece of humanities or art uh, by asking what the author intended and what they meant to do. It's not like that is an incorrect way to approach analysis of art. I would just suggest to you that it is one of many ways to approach art. And to limit yourself by saying there's only one way is just that, limiting. And that's why it's a mistake. So we're not going to do that in this class. We will sometimes discuss what these writers and filmmakers meant. That's a part of the whole analysis of a piece of art, but we want to not confine ourselves to that, to limit ourselves to this idea. So there is this myth that when I or you, when we approach a work of art, a work of humanities, that we approach as an objective, neutral observer. We go up to a painting and we say that painting was done by someone with a lot of ideas and uh, a, a lot of intent a lot of values, whatever, went into that painting. But I, this myth says, I am a neutral observer, that I am what we call objective, which means I'm able to just sort of stand back out of any of my own biases. I'm just seeing it as it is, and I'm interpreting it 
as a cold, objective, neutral, empty vessel observer. However, this is not true. So actually, think of it this way. When you approach a work of art, you come to that work of art with a history. You come to that work of art with a set of assumptions about how the world works, about, about other people, things about society. You know, you have a history, like uh, of, you have a history of race, of gender, of geographic location, of sexuality, of society, the norms and whatever culture or community you grew up in. All of these things you bring with you to the interpretation of art. And we'll do a couple of exercises as we move forward later that will show you that this is true, even though it might sound like some kind of out there humanities professor thing. This is very important. Think of it this way. Say you go see a painting in a museum. You're, let's say you go when you're 20 years old and you see this painting and you think certain things about it. You have certain reactions to that painting. You sort of connect with that painting a certain way. Yeah, there's a painting there. It's static. It's still. But you come to it and you sort of create this relationship with it where you are interpreting things about it and you're having feelings and ideas that come about because of this work of art. Now, let's say five years go by, 10 years, a year, whatever, an amount of time goes by and you return to that museum to the same painting. Now, notice something interesting here. Has the painting changed? Not likely. However, what has changed? You have. You are not even the same person as you were when you came to the work of art the first time. So this helps you see that you're not a neutral, objective observer. You're a person who's constantly changing and growing and learning and sometimes growing backwards. You know, and I'm not saying it's all positive, but the idea is you are a changing person. It's sort of in flow, in flux. And your values now probably aren't the same as they were five years ago or the same as they will be five years from now. By values, I mean the things you think about that are important in the world. We derive meaning from that work of art based on who we are, not just what the art is. To help illustrate what I'm talking about, let's think of All That You Love Will Be Carried Away when Alfie is waiting on the wind to die down to see if that light is going to blow off, uh, blow out and the farm across the way, because he's, he's making up his mind whether he's going to kill himself or not based on the wind. Think about it for a second. Wind is just weather patterns. It's molecules. It's the way the planets move. I'm actually not even entirely sure what wind is. I've often wondered. But Alfie is attributing a lot of meaning to that wind. Now, it's not that the wind has that meaning, because you could go, well, Alfie, that wind has nothing to do with whether you kill yourself or not, dude. And that's true. But where is the meaning coming from? It's coming from inside Alfie. 